Hello everyone, welcome to MindBrain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in MindBrain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes, but it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today I'll talk about the new neuropsychology videos that I have been working for you. I will just describe all the topics that will be the following videos, so stay tuned. But now, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology, the second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology, the third the neuropsychology handbook, the fourth is the clinical neuropsychology the second edition, the fifth is the neuropsychological assessment by Lezak, and the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology by Lara Goldstein and Jenny McNeil. So now let's see the topics that are related with this new neuropsychology series here in MindBrain Talks. The first is Introduction to Brain and Neuropsychology. The second is Neurons and Glia Cells. The third is Essentials of Functional Neuroanatomy. The fourth is Basics of Neural Networks. Introduction to Neuropsychological Syndromes. Neurocognitive Functions. Executive Functions, Complex Attention, Memory and Learning, Language and Communication, Visual Organization, Psychomotor Functions, Reasoning and Speed Processing, Social Cognition, Neuropsychology of Emotions, Neuropsychological Assessment, and neuropsychological rehabilitation. So, these are the main topics that I will cover in the following videos. These topics are concerned with this new series of neuropsychology that you may find here in MindBrain Talks. I hope that you enjoy it. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description to see the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the topics that you saw here. Welcome to MindBrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to MindBrain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in MindBrain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is concerning to the brain. In this lecture, I'll show to you the several major points that we can use to study the brain, ok? But first, let's see the books that I recommend to you. The first, it's the Principles of Neuropsychology. The second, it's the seventh edition of the Fundamentals of Neuropsychology from Brian Cold and Ian Wishaw. 
The third book is the third edition of the Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology, second edition. The fifth book is the Neuropsychological Assessment from Mezak. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology from uh, Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. So, now let's see um, what is the brain and how neuropsychology and neuroscience regards the brain, alright? So, let's go! So, the brain is the physical organ that makes all the mental processes available or possible. Uh, mental processes, I'm talking about cognition, emotion, behavior, psychological needs, interpersonal relationships and so forth. Also, neuropsychology and neuroscience regard the brain as the organ of the mind. And the brain is composed by neurons and glial cells, which are described as the nerve cells and the fundamental unities of the nervous system. So the brain has approximately 100 billion neurons and each neuron may connect with around 10,000 other neurons. Neurons are connected by synapses, but we will see this in the future. The brain is divided in three major levels. Hindbrain or brainstem, which contains medulla oblongata, the pons and cerebellum. The midbrain, which contains the substantia nigra and the superior and inferior colliculi. And the forebrain, which contains the telencephalon, composed by the basal ganglia, limbic system and the cerebral cortex. And the diencephalon, which contains the thalamus, hypothalamus and mammillary bodies. So, the brain is also composed by several layers of tissues called meninges. Some of these tissues are very important in protecting the brain if some major traumatic event occur. So, the brain also has a complex vascular system, which takes the blood to the brain, and this blood leaves the necessary nutrients that nerve cells also need to function. So, the brain also has four major ventricles, which are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So, the cerebral spinal fluid is very important in keeping the brain healthy by removing the dead nerve cells. So, now let's see the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex has two hemispheres, left and right, and these hemispheres have a folded structure, which are called gyri and salchi. Cerebral cortex is divided also in four major areas, the frontal lobes, which are responsible mainly for the higher order mental processes, such as personality, executive functions and so forth. The occipital lobes, which are concerning the functions of vision and visual processing system. Parietal lobe, which are concerned to the sensory perception and spatial integration. And finally, the temporal lobe, which are mainly responsible for memory, language skills and emotional processing. So, the cerebral cortex is divided into four major areas. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe and temporal lobe. These major areas are responsible for all mental processes and neurocognitive functions. So, why the brain is so important to neuropsychology? As you know, neuropsychology is the intersection between psychology and neuroscience and neuropsychology is concerned to the exploration of the relationships between mind, brain and behavior, which could be normal and abnormal, but essentially the abnormal conditions are related to neuropathological diseases. So, the neuropsychology explores the relationships between mind, brain and behavior through several instruments. One of them are standardized neuropsychological tests, or self-rating and observational scales, brain imaging, and electroencephalography. These are the four major methods that neuropsychologists use to explore how the mind and how the brain influences behavior. So now let's take a brief summary, okay? So the brain is defined as the most complex organ because it's the organ that allows humans to have cognition, emotion, behavior and social relationships. It has several divisions, as we saw, the brainstem, the forebrain, and the cerebral cortex has several lobes. So, we also saw that the neuropsychology is the scientific discipline that studies mind, brain and behavior. So, why are we fascinated by this organ? The brain, it's the organ of the mind. 
It's because we have functional brain that we can dream, that we can think, that we can fantasize and reflect upon the wonders of life. So the brain is the organ that allows all humans to have a higher order abilities and mental processes such as imagination, thinking, fantasizing and emotions. So the brain is the biological organ that allows us to take a step further in the animal hierarchy. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the books and the manuals that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your minds and to express your thoughts. Let me know about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is focused on neurons and glial cells. These types of cells are the ones who allow the neurocognitive functions and the mental processes to operate. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the clinical neuropsychology the second edition. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment by Lezac. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology by Lara Goldstein and Jenny McNeil. So now let's take a look on neurons and glial cells. So neurons are a type of nervous cell that makes up the nervous system and supports neurocognitive functions and other body functions. Normally we tend to divide neurons in three major areas. The cell body, which contains the organelles, dendrites, that carry the information from other neurons and the axons that have a branching structure that transmits the action potential. Neurons may have electrical and chemical communications and neurons communicate with each other by synapses which are small gaps between axons and dendrites. So, an action potential is an electrical current which is propagated down to the presynaptic neuron through depolarization and repolarization that allows the communication between neurons. It's by the action of these potentials that neurotransmitters are released in the synaptic cleft. So, neurotransmitters are chemical agents that are released in the synaptic cleft and affect the properties of other neurons. So, there are different types of neurons. We call the unipolar, which have a single process of communication, bipolar, which have one axon and one dendrite, multipolar, which have one axon and two or more dendrites, Golgi-1 neurons, with projecting axonal processes such as pyramid cells, Purkinje cells and other anterior horn cells and Golgi-2 neurons, neurons whose axonal processes project locally. One example is the granulate cells. Now let's see a figure where you can find the three major areas of the neuron. So here you can find a representation of a neuron. As you can see, 
here there is the dendrites, here is the cell body, and this elongated structure is the axon. It's by this elongated structure that uh, the action potential is propagated through the neuron. So, there are other types of cells, which are the glial cells. Glial cells are non-neuronal cells in the central nervous system. They have several functions. They surround neurons and hold them in place. They supply nutrients and oxygen to the neurons. They insulate one neuron from the other. And they have a function of destroying some pathogens. Also, there are several types of glial cells. Astrocytes. They regulate levels of neurotransmitters around synapses and provide metabolic support. Oligodendrocytes. They support the axons of neurons in the central nervous system. There are also the microglia, which are the immunocompetent and phagocytosis cells of the nervous system. Also, there are other types of macroglia in the central nervous systems, which are epidemal cells involved in creating the cerebral fluid. Radioglia cells, which are progenitor cells that can generate neurons such as astrocyte and oligodendrocytes. We can see other types of macroglia cells in the peripheral nervous system. The Schwann cells, which millionate neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And this is a function that is similar to the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Satellite cells. Satellite cells surround neurons in the parasympathetic the ganglia that help to regulate the chemical environment. And the enteric glial cells, found in nerves in the digestive system. So, in the following picture, you will see that glial cells may be divided from the cells that are in the central nervous system and the glial cells that are in the peripheral nervous system. So, here you have a representation of several types of glial cells. In the central nervous system, we have ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes and microglia. In the peripheral nervous system, satellite cells and Schwann cells. So, glial cells may be divided from their location. Some glial cells are in the central nervous system and other glial cells are in the peripheral nervous system. So, now let's take a brief summary and look at the key points. Neurons are the fundamental unit of the central nervous system and they have several structural and functional domains, such as soma, dendrites. Glial cells have supporting actions in the central nervous system and there are different types of glial cells. So this was just a brief, brief introduction of the several types of nervous cells that animals and humans have in their body. But in the future, I will make different videos focused specifically on these cells, ok? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your minds and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. 
So today let's talk about functional neuroanatomy. Functional neuroanatomy it's very important for clinicians if clinicians want to understand which are the underlying brain structures that are responsible for mental processes. But first, let's take a look on the manuals that I recommend for you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook by Arthur Norton and Danny Wedding. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment by Lezak. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on the basics of functional neuroanatomy. So according to Encyclopedia of Clinical Neuropsychology, the study of functional neuroanatomy typically involves several different but related approaches. One is to simply describe a neuroanatomical structure either on a macro or a more micro basis and define what are thought to be the functions normally mediated by that structure. An example of the former might be to list the behaviors believed to be carried out by the right versus left cerebral hemisphere, whereas the latter might focus on a particular gyrus within the hemisphere or even on a selected group of neurons containing within that gyrus. A second approach, which might be referred as a systems approach, is to identify a particular behavior and then attempt to define the nerve cells and pathways thought to be instrumental in its expression. So, as examples, we can take a look on the articulation between the frontal neuroanatomical structures and executive functioning. From a localization X perspective, we know that the frontal cortex is called the home of executive functions. But if we take a connectionist perspective, we know that executive function may be dependent on several complex neural networks which are connected by cortical-cortical relationships and cortical-subcortical relationships, which are connections between the cerebral lobes and the subcortical structures, such as basal ganglia and the amygdala. So here we have an image that may illustrate what I am talking about. Typically, associated with the frontal lobe are processes such as thinking, planning, problem solving, emotions, behavior control, decision making, which may be defined as the executive functions. In the temporal lobe, we have functions such as memory, understanding language, facial recognition, hearing, vision, speech, emotion, and so forth. The parietal lobe, we have functions such as perception, object classification, spelling, knowledge of numbers or visual spatial processing. On the occipital lobe, we have functions such as vision, visual processing or color identification. The cerebellum, we have functions such as gross and fine motor skills and high coordination, body balance. And in the brainstem, which is a part of the brain that regulates body temperature, heart rate, swallowing, breathing, breathing, and so forth. So here we can have an articulation between several functions and several brain structures. And this approach typically looks to the brain processes and their specific brain structures. That is why this is called a localizationist approach. But if we take a connectionist approach, we can see that several processes are articulated with several complex neural networks. And here we can have three major examples. So we can look to several executive functions that are connected with the dorsal prefrontal cortex and its projections to the nucleus caudatus, globus pallidus and the thalamus. Medial prefrontal cortex is connected with the nucleus accumbens globus pallidus and thalamus, and the orbitofrontal cortex, which is connected also to nucleus caudatus, globus pallidus and the thalamus. Here we can see that several networks, several connected networks that are responsible for different processes. We can take processes related to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, such as working memory, thinking processes. In the medial prefrontal cortex, we have functions of decision-making, emotional processing, and the orbital frontal cortex, we have functions such as emotional and behavior control, emotional processing also, social cognition, and decision-making. 
So now let's summarize the key points of the day. There are several approaches to the function of anatomy. We look to the connectionist approach and the localizationist approach. And we saw that there are complex neurocognitive functions that may rely on the localizationist approach and the connectionist approach. Functional neuroanatomy, it's very important for clinicians if you want to understand which brain structures are responsible for several mental processes. The major issue here is that complex brain processes may rely on both approaches, okay? Some processes may be better explained by looking to neuroanatomical structures, but there are other processes that may be better understood if we look complex neural networks that we know that are underlying this process, okay? So a neuropsychologist and a clinical neuropsychologist need to have both ideas in mind, okay? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is focused on neuronal networks. Neuronal networks, it's a topic that I am very interested in because I think that this perspective may help us to understand which are the specific complex networks that are underlying some specific mental processes. But before we look to this, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. So, the first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the seventh edition of the Fundamentals of Human Neuropsychology. The third is the Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology in this second edition. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment by Lezak. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology by Laura Gonstein and Jenny McNeil. So now let's talk about the basics of the complex neuronal networks. Complex neuronal networks are sets of neuronal systems that are interconnected by nodes. Nodes connect a different network with other different network. Neuronal networks are distributed by several brain structures, giving them structural connectivity and functional connectivity. And these complex neuronal networks are responsible for complex mental functions. And these networks have some implications in psychopathology. But I will leave this discussion for future videos, okay? So. So here we can have a taxonomy of functional brain networks. So these are not all the functional networks that are described in neuroscience, but here we can see some of them, okay? So, the first is the occipital network, which mainly is responsible for vision. Then we can have a pericentral network, which is typically associated with somatosensory functions and somatosensory perception. So another one is the dorsal frontal parietal network, which mainly is um, attributed to the functions of attention and the lateral frontal parietal network which is typically associated with cognitive control the mid cingulo insular network which is typically responsible for salience which is a kind of process that uh, mobilizes our attention when we are in need to something okay 
and the last one, medial front operator network, which is typically associated with the default mode network that will be described here, okay? So, the neuronal network's approach may help us to understand which specific brain systems or which specific complex neuronal networks may underlie specific mental processes. So, another network which comprises some of these things that we are talking here is the central executive network, which is a brain network that is responsible for high-level cognitive functions such as planning, decision-making and the control of attention and working memory. That's why this network is called the central executive network. We can see that uh, this network may be uh, conceptualized by several functions which are typically associated with neuronal structures. So, so when we look to dorsal prefrontal cortex, we can see that this brain structure is typically associated with executive functions such as inhibition, cognitive flexibility or updating and is also um, responsible for or typically associated with self-regulation and abstract reasoning. But when we look to the superior and inferior parietal lobules, we can see that these uh, brain structures have implications in working memory, visual and spatial navigation and sensorial integration. So, this is why this neuronal network is called a central executive network. The salience network is a large-scale brain network involved in detecting and orienting to salient external stimuli and internal events. As I said before, when we have some need, uh, some physiological need or some psychological need, this kind of network orients our attention to the stimuli that typically we have coded in memory uh, where we can satisfy our need. So, this salience network has some ramifications in the anterior insula, which is responsible for detection of emotions, sensory-based internal and external stimuli. And when we think about the dorsal, anterior and cingulate cortex, we know that this brain structure typically um, is associated with stimuli response discrimination and conflict prioritization and resolution. So, as we see here, this kind of network is very important when we need to orient our attention towards excelling stimuli. Another very important network is the amygdaloid hippocampal memory network, because this network is a large brain structure that is involved with in memory formation and fear conditioning responses. So, as we can see that this network involves some ramifications in the amygdala, which is typically associated with emotional fear-based conditional learning and somatosensory responses. And of course, uh, when we talk about memory, we know we are uh, somewhat talking about hippocampal cortex, which is responsible mainly for memory formation, encoding and retrieval memory contents. So, and the last one, which is the default mode network, which is a large-scale network of brain areas that form an integrated system of self-related cognition, including autobiographical, self-monitoring and social functions. The default mode network is typically deactivated during stimulus-driven cognitive processing, which means that when we are um, doing some cognitive task, when we are focused on this task, the default mode network deactivates itself. However, when we are thinking about ourselves and thinking about ourselves in the context of our relationships, this brain network is highly active. That's why that we know that this network has some ramifications with several brain structures that are related to the self. So, we can see that uh, this network is connected to the medial prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for self-regulating decision-making, autobiographical memories and future aims reflection. Also, the default mode network has ramifications to the posterior cingulate cortex and precuneus, which are brain areas responsible for bottom-up attentional processing with perception and memory stimuli, self and other thinking, thinking about memories and concepts, and visual and sensory motor processing. The default mode network has some ramifications to the angular gyrus, which is a brain structure responsible for integration of attention and perception, and also responsible for uh, spatial cognition. So, we know that the default mode network may be the neural substract of the self, which is the overall representation that we have about ourselves. Because we know that the self have some uh, functions um, related with autobiographical information, self-references, emotions of oneself, thinking about others, 
which sometimes is called theory of mind, emotions of the other, moral reasoning, social evaluations or assessment and social categories. Also, the self also has other functions such as remembering the past, imagining the future, which is connected to episodic memory and story comprehension. All these complex functions are related to the representation of ourselves, which may be seen as the self or the concept of self. The self is typically a psychotherapeutic target for several modalities of psychotherapy, but I will leave this further description for future videos, ok? So stay tuned! So neuronal networks are several brain systems that are connected with themselves and these networks have some ramifications with different brain structures and we know that these brain structures are somewhat associated with several mental processes and neurocognitive functions. And now let's just look to the summary and key points of our talk today. So we saw that there are different complex neural networks and one typically associated with executive functions is the central executive network. Uh, another network that, which is uh, responsible for orienting our attention towards the internal events or external events is the salience network. Typically there is another network associated with memory formation which is the amygdaloid hippocampal memory network. And finally, we've talked about the default mode network, which is thought to be the neuronal substrate of the self and encompasses several functions, when, uh, one of the most salient is the self-related cognition. So I know that I've talked about lots of information because the neural network's perspective is a very complex field, but don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos detailing about all these things, ok? So stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme, to see the manuals and the articles that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, like, share and subscribe this video. Also, you can leave a comment to say what you think about all of this. Let me know all the thoughts that you have related with this topic. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics of psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today we'll talk about neurocognitive functions. I've made a brief video where I will describe the main neurocognitive functions that are studied in neuropsychology. But first, let's see the books that I recommend to you. The first is The Principles of Neuropsychology. The second is The Fundamentals of Human Neuropsychology. The third is The Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is The Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology, second edition. The fifth is The Neuropsychological Assessment by Lezak. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's see what is neurocognitive functions. Neurocognitive functions are a diverse psychological process that rely on particular areas, neural pathways or cortical networks in the brain. These processes, these mental processes, may be viewed as the substrate of the brain's neurological matrix as a result of the interconnections at the cellular and the molecular level. Neurocognitive functions are essentials in cognitive, emotional and social processing. 
Also, neurocognitive functions are extremely important in automatic and voluntary movements. So now let's see which functions are we talking about. Executive functions, which encompasses inhibition, updating, shifting, planning, decision-making, cognitive flexibility and so forth. Complex attention, which encompasses arousal, sustained, selective, alternate and divided attention. As you are seeing here, the neurocognitive process of attention is subdivided in several sub-processes. Memory and learning, which encompasses functions such as working memory, declarative memory, semantic memory and the process of recall and cued memory. Also, other neurocognitive functions are the domain of language and communication, which encompasses fluency and phonemics, expressive speaking, understanding and writing. This domain is typically associated with the domains of communication and language understanding, okay? So, another one, reasoning and speed of processing, which encompasses deductive thinking, inductive thinking, abstract and concrete thinking, okay? These functions are typically associated with psychopathology, namely in psychosis and schizophrenia, and this domain is very important when we are talking about thinking processes and judgment. Perceptual organization, which encompasses the visual and spatial constructive skills. This domain is a domain where we use several functions to build up the world that we are seeing, the world that we are hearing, and the world that we are sensing. So, perceptual organization is a very important domain. Psychomotor functions, which includes praxis and gnosis, which are a set of functions that allows humans to have several movements psychologically motivated. Social cognition, which encompasses representation of the self and the others. Social cognition is also a domain studied in psychology and clinical psychology and psychotherapy. But here we are looking to this domain as a domain which has several neural bases. And this domain is also important in how we understand the others and how we represent our relationships in our mind. Also, I have had another domain called Neuropsychology of Personality, where I will talk about the neuronal basis of the self. Basically, I will describe some research focused on the neurobiological basis of the personality traits. And the last one, Neuropsychology of Emotions, which are mainly concerned about cognitive representation of emotions and the cognitive description of emotions, okay? So, these are the main neurocognitive functions that will be described in future videos, okay? So, here is a diagram that may help you to understand other uh, neurocognitive functions that were not described here. These neurocognitive domains was also described in the DSM-5. We can see the perceptual motor function, language, learning and memory, social cognition, complex attention, and executive functions. As you are seeing here, some of the neurocognitive processes are rearranged in a different manner. This is just a diagram that may help you to better understand and to categorize these neurocognitive functions, okay? So the following videos will be dedicated specifically to each neurocognitive domain. I will describe more deeply the specificities of each neurocognitive domain, okay? So stay tuned. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description to see the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, 
I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about executive functions. Executive functions are a set of cognitive abilities that are very important for a person to operate in everyday life. There are several definitions of executive functions, but first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. It's the seventh edition. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology, 2nd edition. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment, 5th edition, by Muriel Lezac. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology, by Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. So now let's take a brief overview on executive functions. So, executive functions may be described as a collection of processes that are responsible for guiding, directing, and managing cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functions, particularly during active novel problem solving. Barron says that executive functioning skills allow an individual to perceive stimuli from his or her environment, respond adaptively, flexibly change direction, anticipate future goals, consider consequences, and respond in an integrated or common sense way. Friedman and colleagues say that Executive functions may be described as a family of cognitive control process that operate on a lower level process to regulate and shape behavior. Priban says, the frontal cortex is critically involved in implementing executive programs where these are necessary to maintain brain organization in the face of insufficient redundancy in input processing and in the outcomes of behavior. Susan Benson says that executive functions is a generic term that refers to a variety of different capacities that enable purposeful, goal-directed behavior, including behavior regulation, working memory, planning and organizational skills, and self-monitoring. Wezak says that executive functions refer to a collection of interrelated cognitive and behavioral skills responsible for purposeful, goal-directed activity and include the highest level of human functioning, such as intellect, thought, self-control and social interaction. So, executive functions may have different definitions because different authors tend to emphasize different aspects of this construct. So, the main definition of executive functions is an ongoing discussion in neuropsychology. But now, let's see how we can divide different executive functions based on different neuroanatomical structures. So, now let's take a look on how executive functions may be conceptualized within a neuroanatomical perspective. In the dorsal prefrontal cortex, we can see that this neuroatomic area tends to be associated with several executive functions, such as the generic term of executive functions, working memory, sequencing, cognitive flexibility and response monitoring. The orbitofrontal cortex tends to be associated with emotional processing, social cognition and empathy, response inhibition and reward estimation. The ventromedial cortex tend to be associated with decision-making, effective regulation, long-term memory and the self-concept representation. And finally, the anterior cingulate cortex tend to be associated with response monitoring, error monitoring, internal conflict resolution and motivational and effective behavior. So, all these processes may be attributable to the concept of executive functions. However, there are several models that tend to emphasize different aspects and different sub-processes. But the major message here is that executive functions tend to be associated with different areas in the frontal lobe and these functions tend to regulate other cognitive operations. I know this is just an introductory video, but in the future I will make different videos focused on different executive functions. 
So now let's just see the summary and the key points for today. So, executive functions may be viewed as an extremely complex construct because several authors tend to emphasize different aspects. This is an ongoing debate in clinical research and in scientific research, so we don't have a consensual definition for this set of functions, okay? However, we can describe them as a set of low-level and higher-order cognitive functions responsible for goal-directed behavior. This is a very simplistic definition, but it may help us to understand what these processes are focused on. So, when we are talking about executive functions, typically we are talking about the cognitive flexibility, working memory, behavioral innovation, decision-making, problem-solving, planning, and so forth. And executive functions may be differentiated based on different neuroanatomical structures. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description to see the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, like, share and subscribe this video. Also, you can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about complex intention. Typically, we don't think in attention as a differentiated process, but as we will see here, attention may be divided in several sub-processes or if you prefer, in several attentional processes. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So now let's take a look on complex attention. Attention is a complex mental or neurocognitive process that allows human beings to focus, select and maintain mental resources in internal and external stimuli. Complex attention may also be viewed as a complex neurocognitive ability needed to process relevant personal information to interpret environmental and internal cues. Also, complex attention is required in everyday life. There are some determinants of complex attention. Amplitude – the quantity of information that we can pay attention to. Intensity – typically is understood as the amount of attentional resources which are paying attention to a given stimulus. Shifting. Alternating attention is the ability to be able to change the focus of attention from one event to another. And the focal point. Typically, it's distinguished by three major aspects. Direction, which may be external or internal. Amplitude. We can focus our attention to one or several stimuli and control, where our attention can be voluntary or involuntary. Also, here I will use the clinical model of Schaubeck and Mathieu, which is a model that helps us to understand several sub-attentional processes that are required to process information. Arousal, which typically is described as the automatic reaction towards the stimuli. 
focused attention, the ability to be focused in one specific stimuli. Maintaining attention, the ability to maintain attentional resources and respond correctly for a long period of time. Selective attention, the ability to select and reject irrelevant stimuli. Alternate attention, ability to change the attentional focus between two or more stimuli. And divided attention, ability to focus attention on two or more tasks at the same time. Now you understand why I call this complex attention. Attention may be divided in these five sub-processes. Also, we can find several attentional difficulties or disorders. Here I will just describe a summary of all the attentional difficulties because I will produce different videos in the future specifically talking about these aspects, okay? Typically talking about attentional difficulties. So, one that maybe described is a prosexemia, which is the total absence of attention, typically in coma. Hypoprosexemia, which is the decrease of attention. Pseudoprosexemia, decrease of attention in complex environments. Paraprosexemia, abnormal direction of attention, typically when individuals start to pay attention to irrelevant stimuli it seems that there are some impairment in the attentional process. And hyperprosexemia, which is an excessive increase of attention. Typically, this is observed in the bipolar disorder when individuals have a maniac crisis. So now, let's see the summary and key points. Complex attention may be viewed as a complex neurocognitive domain because it has several types of attentions which are differentiated in different attentional processes and there are several difficulties or several disorders that we can attribute to impairments in the attentional processes. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding to this team if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, like, share and subscribe this video. It's very important to support the channel. Also, you can leave a comment in the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience, and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino. I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher, and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today let's talk about the domain of memory and learning. Memory and learning, it's a domain that is very important in clinical neuropsychology because there are several neuropsychological conditions that have memory impairments. So, it's very common to see individuals that have difficulties in memory, but first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology, the second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology, the third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on memory and learning. Memory may be described as the cognitive process that are used to acquire, store, retain and later retrieve information. Typically, memory helps us to maintain a sense of coherence of ourselves and the world around us. 
allows human beings to learn and to keep learning during lifetime. And memory and learning is extremely important in everyday life. Typically, three major processes are involved in memory. Encoding, which means that mental information needs to be encoded to be remembered. Storage, mental contents need to be stored within different modalities, which may be described as levels of processing, in order to be kept. And retrieval, which is the ability to recall stored information and to use it accordingly. Typically, we can differentiate two processes, which are recognition and recall. Also, there are different types of memory. Sensorial memory, which is the ability to quickly understand what a stimulus is received by the senses. Typically, we can describe this as iconic, echoic, and haptic memory. Don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos focused specifically on these kinds of memory, okay? Short term memory, ability to recall mental contents for a brief period of time within seconds to a minute and without rehearsing. Broadband found that our short-term memory typically have 7 plus or minus 2 items and sometimes some authors describe short-term memory as working memory and working memory may be viewed as an executive function. Long-term memory, which is described as the lifelong storage of unlimited information typically regarding to life experiences, events, abilities, and so forth. So memory, it's a very important neurocognitive process because without memory, we were not able to recall and to remember all the things that made us who we are. I can give an example. For instance, Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's disease, it's a disease that individuals start to lose their memory abilities that typically affects the episodic memory. Individuals start to lose the ability to recall things from their life because sometimes they can't even recognize their spouse. So we can look to the model of Atkins and Schifrin, which describes the process model of memory formation. Typically, when we see the sensor information, which passes to the short-term memory, and from the short-term memory, if mental contents are uh, rehearsed, they pass to the long-term memory. However, the information must be encoded through these different stages. And if mental contents are rehearsed sufficiently, typically they pass to the long-term memory. However, when we don't encode and we don't rehearse, all information tends to be lost. In sensory memory, typically the information is lost because it's not encoded. In short-term memory, typically information is lost because it is not encoded also. And if we don't increase the encoding of the information during these stages, typically in long-term memory, the information is lost to the retrieval failure. Now let's take to a more neurobiological model of memory. Memory may be divided in declarative memory or non-declarative memory. Declarative memory is divided in facts and events and tend to be stored in hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe and the diacephalon. Non-declarative memory, which tends to be described as the implicit memory, encompasses several elements, skills and habits, which are stored in the striatum, motor cortex and the cerebellum. Priming memory, typically is associated with the neocortex. And the basic associative learning, which may be emotional responses or skeletal musculature. Emotional responses are typically uh, stored in the amygdala, which is connected with the hippocampus, and the skeletal musculature patterns tend to be stored in the cerebellum, which is also connected with the hippocampus. Finally, the non-associative learning, which is associated with the reflex pathways. I know that memory and learning are very complex themes, but don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos detailing more of these aspects of memory, okay? Memory is a very complex neurocognitive process. So now let's see the summary and key points. Memory and learning is a human domain that is very important in everyday life and it's very important when we need to remember ourselves and we need to be able to adapt ourselves to our lives. So there are different types of memory elements and process and we saw that 
there are several neuronal structures associated with different types of memories. As I said before, don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos specifically talking about the specific elements of memory and learning, ok? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about language and communication. This domain is also a very important domain in clinical neuropsychology because there are several impairments in language that, that individuals may develop through several neurological conditions. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend for you today. So, the first is the principles of neuropsychology, the second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology, the third is the neuropsychology handbook, the fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology, second edition. The fifth is Neuro Neuropsychological Assessment, 5th edition by Muriel Lezac. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology by Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. So now let's take a look on language and communication. Language may be described as a system of symbols and rules that allow us to communicate. Symbol is something that represents something else just like a flag or just like a letter which represents a sound and language has rules which are specific ways of ordering symbols there is a communication when a signal is emitted between a sender and the receiver and this signal is understood language is a complex and dynamic system of combined symbols used in different ways to communicate and think this is the standard definition of American speech language hearing association. So, there are five channels of human communication. The verbal channel, which is a communication through words and phrases. Prosodic channel, which is the intonation, rhythm, accent and pauses that we use during our narratives and during our speech. Paralinguistic channel, which is referred to the tone of voice, silences, interjections and expressions such as crying, mm, yawing. We use these noises to communicate something without using words. Kinetic channel, which refers to movements, movements of the face, head, body posture or body gestures. Static features of the interaction, which is referred to the interpersonal distance, orientation of the body and the aspect of a person. Also, there are several linguistic processes. Fluency, which may be phonetics or semantic, which is the ability to produce different words. Object naming, which is the ability to give a name to objects. Word finding, which is the ability to find a word in memory and use that word within a given sentence. Grammar and syntax, 
from the neuropsychological perspective may be viewed as the ability to learn and apply language conventions such as grammar and syntax in order to think and communicate simple and complex ideas. Expressive language, which may be viewed as the ability to produce adequate speech and receptive language, which also from the neuropsychological perspective may be viewed as the ability to decode and understand other speech. Language and communication is a very broad domain, but have several specifications that I've described here. These specifications are very, very important for the communication between individuals. When we have some neurological condition that affects the language communication, typically language comprehension or language production, individuals start to feel very isolated and start to have several difficulties in expressing themselves and to be understood by the others. So now let's take a brief look on the neuroanatomical structures of language. So, there are several areas that are typically described as the neuronal basis for language and communication. The first is Broca's area, which is involved in production of speech. Wernicke area, which is involved in understanding of speech. Motor cortex, which is responsible for the controls of the movements of muscles. And the arcuate fascicles, which connects Wernicke's area to Broca's area. So, these areas are connected with each other and these areas are typically described as the main areas responsible for language and communication, okay? So now let's see the summary and the key points. So language allows communication between ourselves and others. We look to five channels of human communication and we saw that there are different types of language processes. And we look to basic neuroanatomical structures of language. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please like, share and subscribe this video to support the channel. Also, you can leave a comment on the comment section below expressing your mind and expressing your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about reasoning and speed of processing. This domain typically is a domain that is very important in neuropsychology because it's the domain that we can see how individuals are processing the information. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. It's the second edition. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment and the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on reasoning and processing speed. Reasoning is associated with every major human achievement that encompasses art, engineering, mathematics, philosophy, culture and so forth. Reasoning is also associated with the thought process and with problem solving which is several abilities which are usually developed in human species. 
Processing speed is also extremely important in every cognitive process associated with reasoning, academic or job performance and intellectual development. So now let's see specifically how we can define these two, these two cognitive processes. So let's start with reasoning. Reasoning typically is associated to the act of thinking and involves using logic and intellect to produce a conclusion or a judgment about something. It's also associated with the abstraction and intelligence. Typically, we can describe deductive and inductive reasoning, and reasoning process may also be prone to fallacies, heuristics and cognitive distortion. Don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos focused specifically on these aspects of the reasoning process, ok? Processing speed is a cognitive ability required in every cognitive domain, because in every mental operation that we use in our daily life because if we do not process quickly our mental contents these mental contents as we saw in the previous presentation about memory these mental contents tend to be forgotten because they are not encoded okay so processing speed is very important in the encoding process processing speed may also be described as the time it takes to a person to do a mental task it may also be described as the time that an individual takes to understand and to react to a given information that was received, of course. So, it may be also viewed as the time between receiving and responding to a given stimulus. Both reasoning and processing speed are very important in planning and organizing thoughts in daily life activities. They are also very, very important in problem solving, decision making starting tasks and an in complex attentional process which were described previously. Typically reasoning and processing speed are associated with the frontal lobe. There are several aspects described as the higher order cognition that are typically associated with the frontal lobe. Some features or executive skills or higher order cognitive skills may be described as planning, mental organization, problem solving, decision making, personality traits or personality as a whole, abstraction and judgment. So reasoning is involved in all of these higher order cognitive traits, higher order cognitive functions, ok? So now let's see the summary and key points. We saw that reasoning and processing speed is an essential human feature, both are required to process mental contents. Both are also required to normal human functioning in everyday life and we saw that reasoning is also associated with the frontal lobe. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about perceptual organization. Perceptual organization encompasses several processes that are very important when we need to make some perceptions about the world that we are living. 
But before we get further on this, first let's see the main ones that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on perceptual organization. So, perceptual organization is a process or a set of processes that enables the human mind to interpret the sensorial clues that reach the cortex from the senses. It is a core aspect of the human mind because it allows humans to interpret and make sense of the environmental context where they perform. Perceptual organization was first studied by Gestalt psychologists which were a group of psychologists who studied perception and developed several perceptual principles. The most well-known Gestalt psychologists were Kafka, Kohler and Wertheimer. So, Gestalt psychologists developed several perceptual principles. Law of Pregnas The human brain has a tendency to perceive the objects in an environment as simple, stable and as the best form as possible. Kafka, in 1935, was the psychologist who developed this principle. Figure ground relationship. The human brain is able to perceive a figure in a meaningful manner in the background, with it being separate of the background. So this law means that we can look to a figure and we can perceive several objects in that figure without distorting it. Perceptual constancy. The human brain has the tendency to perceive objects as unchanging and stable in size and shape. Several examples may be given, such as stable in color, size, brightness. So, we tend to look the objects and we tend to see these objects with stable characteristics. Perceptual grouping. The human brain has a tendency to perceive objects and to group them based on several recognizable patterns. So, we can look to several, several objects, but if these objects have the same color, we tend to group them together. For instance, we can group several circles based on yellow color or several crosses in red color. Okay? Law of closure. The human brain has a tendency to fill the gaps between several salient stimuli, as examples, several objects, in order to develop an integrated representation of the object. So, we tend to fill the gaps between the lines of the objects. We tend to fill the gaps between the phrases that we hear and we tend to fill the gaps in the narratives that we hear. So we can see other gestalt principles that can be applied to these rules. Principles of similarity, proximity, symmetry, connectedness, brightness, collinearity and common shape. So gestalt psychologists studied these principles and saw that human perception is ruled by these principles. Also, there are several factors that can affect our perceptual organization. Our perceptual learning, our perception of space, our mental state, our motivations and needs, and finally our cognitive styles. In the future, I will produce several videos focused specifically on these, on these factors that can affect our perception, okay? but I will leave that for future videos. So, and when we look to the brain, we can see that our perceptual organization rely on several brain structures. Parietal cortex, occipital cortex, temporal cortex, and frontal cortex, and associated subcortical structures, such as the thalamus and the amygdala. So, other subcortical structures are also very important in perceptual organization, okay? So, take this in mind. So now let's look to the summary and key points. So, perceptual organization is a process or a set of processes that enables the human mind to interpret and to make sense of stimuli. Gestalt psychologists discovered several rules and principles that tend to guide our perception. There are several factors that affect our perceptual organization and we saw that our perceptual skills depends on several brain structures. So, perceptual organization is a very complex theme in cognitive psychology and in neuropsychology. These are just uh, the major aspects of our perception. 
In the future, I will produce different videos focused specifically on each point of our perception. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please like, share and subscribe this video to support the channel. Also, you can leave a comment in the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about psychomotor functions. Psychomotor functions are a set of functions that are very important if you want to operate physically something that we represent mentally. Before we take a deep look on this, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first, it's the principles of neuropsychology. The second, it's the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on psychomotor functions. Psychomotor functions are a set of voluntary and involuntary movements related with neurocognitive processing, with direct impacts on observable behavior. Psychomotor functions involve the combination between precise motor responses with attention, error correction and problem-solving abilities. Psychomotor functions may also be viewed as a wide range of actions towards an objective, involving muscle and physical movement, gross and fine skills, which are related with the central nervous system. Behavioral examples include driving a car and eye-hand coordination tasks, such as cooking, throwing a ball, typing, operating a machine and playing an instrument. According with the Britannic Encyclopedia, everyday activities are composed by a set of integrated skills. It's the combination between fine and gross muscle movements that allows individuals to operate behaviorally what we are thinking. Psychomotor functions are also be seen as the individual's ability to analyze the mechanics of a motor task, his verbal ability and other intellectual and perceptual attributes may influence his acquisition of a skill. Psychomotor habits are mediated primarily by the sensory and motor cortex of the brain and by the neural fibers that connect the two cerebral hemispheres. According to the majority of the theoreticians, learning outcomes can be correlated with the amount of duration of the reward practice which means that our learning behaviors may be augmented if these behaviors are somewhat rewarded by some salient stimuli. The effects of the associative and motivational factors are believed to enhance learning, while inhibitory and oscillatory, which means variability, factors are thought to detract from the learning of psychomotor skills. So, psychomotor functions are very important when we want to operate behaviorally or externally one idea that we have thought before. So, psychomotor functions are the way that we express what we are thinking. So, now let's see the summary and key points. Psychomotor functions may be viewed as behavioral aspects of the neurocognitive processing. 
Psychomotor functions are skills that are required in everyday life, such as driving a car or operating a machine. Psychomotor functions are related with sensory and motor cortex of the brain. Our learned behaviors are also associated with reward practice. In the future, I will detail all these aspects in different videos, ok? So stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about social cognition. Social cognition is a domain that is studied by several areas in psychology, such as generic psychology, clinical psychology, even psychotherapy, social psychology and so forth. Here I will take a more clinical perspective on social cognition, ok? Because social cognition may have a clinical perspective, especially when we want to see how individuals conceptualize their relationship with the other. But first, let's see the manners that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology, the second edition. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment by Muriel Lezac. And the sixth, it's the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on social cognition. Social cognition refers to a complex set of neurocognitive abilities underlying social stimulus perception, processing, interpretation and response. These abilities support the development of adequate social competence and adaptation. Social cognition impairments typically are associated with neuropsychological deficits. Social cognition defines some of the most clinical significant social cognitive abilities. Face processing, facial expression processing, joint attention, theory of mind, which implies reflections about the other's mind, empathy, and moral processing. Social cognition impairments can be attributable to lesions in brain structures, frontal lobes, Emotional responses to social stimuli and performance on theory of mind tasks. Again, impairments in frontal lobes tend to be described in people with autism, schizophrenia and psychopathy. Lesions in the temporal lobe, specifically in the fusiform gyrus, tend to produce inability to recognize faces. Social cognition is very important when we are thinking about ourselves and when we are thinking about ourselves in the context or the relationships with the others. Social cognition may help us to understand how we represent ourselves and how we, we represent the other. This is very important because sometimes in clinical settings we need to know how individuals think that the others are seeing them. And this issue may be very important, especially in psychotherapy. I know that here we are taking a more uh, neuropsychological approach because social cognition may have differentiated neuroanatomical structures. 
So, this is just a short video on social cognition. However, in the future, I will produce several other videos where I'll detail other aspects associated with social cognition. Social cognition refers to processes underlying social stimulus. Social cognition refers to face processing, facial expression processing and theory of mind. Impairments in social cognition tend to be associated with the frontal lobe, but it's not specifically in the frontal lobe that social cognition deficits may be attributable. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today let's talk about the neuropsychology of personality. The neuropsychology of personality it's a very, very important field because it's the field where we try to explore the neuronal basis of the personality traits. So, there are lots of discussions and this is an ongoing theme. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on the Neuropsychology of Personality. Personality is a concept that tends to be used to describe a set of features that manifest a unique profile of an individual. This unique set of characteristics are defined as the personality traits. Typically, these traits may be manifest in core beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, motivations and needs. Neuropsychology of personality tends to explore the neural basis, typically we are talking about the brain structures and neurotransmitter systems of personality traits. Neuropsychology of personality explored also the neural correlates between neurocognitive skills and other personality traits. Correlations between executive functions and openness to experience is just a simple example of these neuronal correlates that are studied in neuropsychology of personality. Previously, relationships between brain structures and personality traits were detailed in, in one major case that allow us to have some different ideas about how the brain may correlate with personality traits. This was the case of Phineas Gage, where the destruction of the orbit of frontal cortex led to profound personality changes. These changes were impulsivity, risk behavior and decision-making deficits. In this sense, clinicians start to understand that there may be some correlates between brain structures and some personality traits. In this case, we are talking about the destruction of the orbitofrontal cortex, which is an area related with decision-making and affective modulation, which implied some modifications on the Phineas Gage personality. 
Several studies explore the correlates between neurocognitive function and personality traits. I give here two examples. Deficits in attention, immediate and delayed memory. Visual special abilities and language correlated with the trait impulsivity in borderline personality disorder. Openness to experience correlate more strongly with verbal crystallized intelligence than executive function and fluency. So this shows that our personality trait openness is more strongly related with verbal crystallized intelligence than executive function and verbal fluency. These are just two examples of a very strong body of research that tends to explore several neurocorrelates between neurocognition or neurocognitive abilities with personality traits. But this is just a small representation of this body of research. So, as I said before, some personality traits may be correlated with the frontal lobe. Typically, we are talking about planning and judgment, mental organization, problem-solving abilities, decision-making abilities, other personality traits, abstraction and affective modulation. So, the frontal lobe tends to be described as the major aspect or the major neuronal structure associated with personality and personality traits. However, we can trace other personality traits to other brain structures, ok? But I will leave that for future videos. So, by taking a localizationist approach, we see that the frontal lobe may be the major neuronal structure that is very, very associated with different personality traits. Personality may be allocated in the major divisions of the frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and cingulate cortex, or even ventromedial cortex. So, several personality traits tend to change when some of this structure of the frontal lobe gets some type of damage. So, now let's see the summary and key points. Neuropsychology of personality explores neural correlates between neurocognitive skills and personality traits. We saw also that the destruction of the orbital frontal cortex led to profound personality change, which implies a relationship between the frontal lobe and personality, alright? So, this is just an introductory video of the neuropsychology of personality, but in the future I will detail more of these issues in further videos, ok? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to MindBrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to MindBrain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in MindBrain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today let's talk about the neuropsychology of emotions. Typically, the emotional domain is a domain that is not very explored by clinical neuropsychologists as, for instance, memory, attention or executive functions. 
but we can see how emotions are extremely important in other neurocognitive processes. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So, now let's take a brief look on the neuropsychology of emotions. Emotions in neuropsychology are typically overshadowed by the assessment of memory, executive functions and language. In this sense, emotions tend not to be the primary target for neuropsychological assessment. However, in the past three decades, there was an increased interest in uncovering the neural architecture of emotion. Some of this uh, interest was related to the magnetic resonance imaging scans that provided several new evidences. Lesions in the amygdala, in the medial prefrontal cortex, in insula, and in the somatosensorial cortex help us to understand that there are several underlying structures related with emotional disorders. In this sense, neuropsychologists start to have a different perspective on the assessment of emotions. In this sense, emotional regulation start to gain some traction in neuropsychology. We define emotional regulation as the intra- and extra-organism factors by which emotional arousal is redirected, controlled, modulated and modified to enable an individual to function adaptively in emotional arousing situations. So, emotion activation may be described as a consequence of two root models. One is the fast emotion processing, which relies on the amygdala, insula, ventral striatum and anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortex. Typically, this is described as the ventral system. And the other route is described as a slow emotion processing that rely on dorsal, lateral and medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate gyros as well as hippocampus and temporal parietal regions. Which means that emotion may be activated through a fast route processing and emotion can be activated through a slow emotion processing route. So here you can have a diagram that tries to explain to you the biological basis of emotional activation. One is relied on top-down appraisal systems, which implies the lateral, medial prefrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex, which is described as a slow emotional processing route. However, when we think about a fast emotional activation route, we think about the basal ganglia and the amygdala which are called as the bottom-up appraisal systems. So we have a top-down appraisal system and a bottom-up appraisal system. Okay? So these are just introductory concepts for you to know that emotional activation tend to follow these two routes. Emotion can be activated through a bottom-up appraisal route or a top-down appraisal route. So, as you probably know, emotional activation is a very complex issue in neuropsychology and neuroscience. Here I will show this diagram for you to understand that the activation of emotion does not rely on just one brain structure or one brain system, okay? Emotional activation is very complex and rely on several brain structures and several brain systems, okay? In the future, I will take a different look or a more in-depth look on these specific areas, okay? You can see that amygdala tends to receive some stimuli from the polymodal sensory cortex and amygdala projects to the hypothalamus which projects to sympathetic activation which implies some activation of the behavioral aspects of emotion such as rapid heartbreak, galvanic skin response, paleness, pupil dilatation, blood pressure elevation and other things. So, there are several brain systems which are associated with the projections from the amygdala which imply a behavioral and somatic emotional activation beyond cognitive activation of the thought processes associated with the emotional processing. So, you need to take this in mind, okay? But in the future, 
we will talk on these more fundamental aspects of emotional activation. So, emotions are a very complex mental state that encompasses several connections between the cortical and subcortical areas in the brain and especially with the neuroendocrine system. Normally we look to this as the neurobiology of emotions, but in the future I will make a different videos specifically focus on the neurobiology of emotions, okay? Here I will try to show how neuropsychology may be very important if you want to study emotions and the emotional experience. But typically emotions are a complex phenomenon that is extremely studied in clinical psychology and psychotherapy. So now let's see the summary and the key points. Typically, emotion is not the main focus in neuropsychology because neuropsychology tends to rely more on neurocognitive processing. MRI showed that, that there are a neuronal architecture of emotion and neuroarchitecture or emotion can help us to understand how emotional processing, how emotions are activated. Emotional processing may be activated by two different routes. One fast route, which is typically associated with the bottom-up appraisals, and one slow route, which typically is associated with the top-down route. And as we saw in the, in the end, there are several brain systems that are related with, neuro, with emotions, which imply that the neurobiology of emotions is a very complex field in neuropsychology and in neuroscience. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind, to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to learn a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is focused on neuropsychological syndrome. I will describe to you the major neuropsychological syndromes that are studied by a clinical neuropsychologist. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment and the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on neuropsychological syndromes. Neuropsychological syndromes are all the neurocognitive impairments that result from the brain dysfunction, congenital or acquired, with profound impact in mental health and daily life. Typically, these syndromes have severe impacts on memory, language, attention and other cognitive processes, such as executive functions. So now let's see some attentional syndromes. Hemispatial neglect consists of an inability to respond to stimuli and that inability is not attributed to the existence of motor or sensory deficits. A prosexemia represents an abnormal inability to pay attention. Hyperprosexemia defines the abnormal state in which a person concentrates on one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Paraprosexemia 
is the inability to pay attention to everything. Typically, we say that these individuals has high levels of distributability. So now let's take a brief look on memory syndromes. Amnesia or hypomnesia, which is an impairment in keeping, storing and recalling mental elements. Usually, amnesia can be differentiated by several neuronal structures. Diencephalic amnesia typically results in confabulation. Temporal lobe amnesia usually gives some impairments in retrog memory. Dissociative amnesia linked to symbolic and affective mental contents. Hyperamnesia abnormal capacity to recall past events or memories. Now let's see movement syndromes. Apraxia which is the inability to properly execute coordinated movements to achieve an end. We can differentiate some different apraxias. Ideational apraxia, which is a disturbance of a single tool use. Idear motor apraxia, which is an impairment on the complex ability to use a tool or several tools. Limb kinetic apraxia, which is the inability to copy a meaningful finger pattern. Dynamic apraxia which is the inability to reproduce a series of hand movements. So now let's take a brief look on visual perceptual and visual constructive syndromes. Agnosia, which consists in a failure in recognition that cannot be attributed to elementary sensory defects, mental deterioration, inattentional disorders, lack of face type name or unfamiliarity with the presented stimulus. Also, we can differentiate some levels of visual perceptual syndromes. Visual perceptive agnosia, which is the impairment to form a mental representation. Visual associative agnosia, which represents the impairment to form a mental semi-signification. Achromatopsia, which is an ability to acquire noticeable color in a part of hemicampus or in the entire visual field. Prosopagnosia, which is an impairment in recognition of familiar faces. So, now let's take the summary and the key points. We take a brief look on the attentional syndromes, memory syndromes, movement syndromes, and visual perceptual or visual constructive syndromes. So, this is just an introductory video for you to see that several neurocognitive syndromes or several neuropsychological syndromes can be associated to several major neurocognitive processes. Don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos talking specifically about each specific syndrome, ok? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please like, share and subscribe this video, ok? And you can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the channel where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump forward to this content. So, today's video is focused on the second part of the introduction to neuropsychological syndromes. In this video, I will describe another set of neuropsychological syndromes that were not explained in the previous video. So stay tuned, but first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. 
The third is the Neuropsychology Handbook. The fourth is the Clinical Neuropsychology, also a handbook. The fifth is Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So, now let's take a brief look on the second part of Neuropsychological Syndromes. So, let's start with the first definition. Neuropsychological syndromes are all the neurocognitive impairments that result from brain dysfunction, congenital or acquired, with a profound impact in mental health and daily life. Typically, these syndromes have severe impacts on memory, language, attention and other cognitive processes, such as executive functions. So, now let's take a brief look on language syndromes. Aphasia which describes a loss or alteration of language as a result of brain damage. This damage may be cortical or subcortical. Now let's take a look on several types of aphasia. Broca aphasia, which results in impairments in fluency. Wernicke aphasia, impairments in language comprehension. Conduction aphasia, impairments in word nomination. Global aphasia, generalized language impairment. Transcortical motor aphasia, reduction in spontaneous speech. Transcortical sensorial aphasia, reduction in comprehension and nomination. Alexia describes reading changes that appears as a consequence of brain damage in subjects who had already acquired reading. Posterior alexia, loss of the ability to read but maintaining the ability to write. Literal alexia, loss of the ability to name the individual letters that make up a word. Verbal alexia, reads the letters but not the words. Global alexia, inability to read letters or words. Central alexia, alexia with the graphia and total or partial loss of reading and writing. Anterior alexia, difficulties in recognizing a spelled word but to a lesser extent that is in central alexia. Agraphia describes the loss of the ability to produce written language due to brain damage. The field of agraphia is less explored than, than the aphasia of the alexia. Aphasic agraphia, alteration of the written language, sparse production, deteriorated handwriting, non-grammatical language, etc. Pure agraphia alexia, consists of an alteration of the written expression in the absence of other language disorders, motorographia and visuo Obtaining correct written communication also depends on motor and visuospatial skills. A change in motor or visuospatial skills functions products faulty writing even though the linguistic component is intact. So, these were the main neurocognitive syndromes related with language. So now let's see the summary and key points. So aphasia describes a loss or alteration of language. Alexia describes the changes in reading abilities. And graphia describes the loss of the ability to produce written language. So in the future I will produce different videos explaining specifically these neurocognitive syndromes related with language. For instance, Broca aphasia and Wernicke aphasia are related with several neuronal structures, but in the future we will take a deep look on this, ok? Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the articles that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, 
psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino. I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in MindBrain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about neurocognitive syndrome. This syndrome was identified based on the complex neural perspective. But before we get further on this, first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So, now let's see the neurocognitive psychopathological syndrome. So, first, let's see the definition of neuropsychological syndrome. Neuropsychological syndromes are all the neurocognitive impairments that result from brain dysfunction, congenital or acquired, with profound impacts in mental health and daily life. Typically, these syndromes have severe impacts on memory, language and other neurocognitive processes. So, now let's look specifically to the neurocognitive syndrome. Neurocognitive syndrome is a set of neurocognitive symptoms that include symptoms in the executive functions, attention, memory and self-perception that are manifested psychologically and can be considered to a certain extent to the dysfunction of four major neuronal networks. So these neural networks are the following Frontoparietal Executive Network Salience Network Amygdaloid Hippocampal Memory Network and Default Mode Network So, when we look to the Frontoparietal Executive Network we see symptoms such as apathy, loss of focus, loss of planning and difficulties in the abstract abilities Also, we see difficulties in visual expression and problem solving and difficulties in mental imagery. In the salience network, we see difficulties in perform and task monitoring, salience confusion, difficulties in insight and emotion-based complex decisions. In the amygdaloid hippocampal memory network, we see hyperactivation of amygdala responses with extreme fear and stress. Also, we see memory perseveration and stagnation and stereotyped memory. So, problems in the default mode network result in difficulties in self-awareness, self-reflection, self-referencing and self-other discrimination. Also, social and emotional disinhibition and impaired social cognition. So, the neurocognitive syndrome must have several symptoms that typically are related with these neural networks. So, we have a, a model here that helps us to understand how the neurocognitive syndrome may be working in the brain. So, we have the top-down inputs, which also have the sensory and the limbic and the self-referential cognition. They all tend to be processed initially in the salience network. However, problems in weak salience mapping result in problems in impoverished cognition in the dorsal prefrontal cortex and deficits in self-referential mental activity, which typically is associated with the default mode network, impairments in the precuneus and impairments in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and in the posterior cortex. So, as you are seeing here, this model helps us to understand how the neurocognitive syndrome may be developed in the brain. So, the neurocognitive syndrome seems to reflect the association of several psychological symptoms that are typically associated with different complex neural networks the default mode network, the frontoparietal network, the salience network and the amygdaloid hippocampal network. So, now let's look to the summary and the key points. We saw that the neurocognitive syndrome has several symptoms associated with several neural networks and these neural networks are extremely important in the cognitive and mental processing. 
These neural networks are the front oriental executive network, the salience network, amygdaloid hippocampal memory network and the default mode network. All these networks are extremely important in the mental processing and when there are impairments in these networks, these symptoms tend to be clustered together and tend to manifest in the flow of consciousness resulting in daily life impairments and difficulties in psychological well-being. So, this is just an introductory video to the Neurocognitive Syndrome and in the future we will take a more in-depth look in the Neurocognitive Syndrome, ok? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's video is the last one regarding to the introduction of neuropsychological syndromes. Today, I will describe to you the last set of neuropsychological syndromes that were not described in the previous video. So, stay tuned! But first, let's take a look on the manuals that I recommend to you. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the Handbook of Clinical Neuropsychology, the second edition. The fifth is the Neuropsychological Assessment. And the sixth is the Clinical Neuropsychology. So, now let's take a brief look on the, the Executive Syndrome, which is one neuropsychological syndrome that is extremely important in neuropsychology. So first, let's look to the main definition of neuropsychological syndromes. Neuropsychological syndromes are all the neurocognitive impairments that result from brain dysfunction, congenital or acquired, with profound impact in mental health and daily life. Typically, these syndromes have severe impacts on memory, language, attention and other cognitive processes such as executive functions or even visual motor skills. So, the executive syndrome or executive dysfunction concerns a set of symptoms typically resulting from brain injury, covering the domain of cognition, emotion and behavior. This syndrome typically results in difficulties in cognitive flexibility, planning, abstract reasoning, impulse inhibition, motivation, decision making and emotion regulation. Executive dysfunction may be present in several psychopathologies, such as attention deficit hyperactivity, conduct disorder, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, or even in physical health and in quality of life. As you can see here, there are several life domains that executive functions are extremely important to maintain a good psychological and good neuropsychological functioning. So the, aspect, so the executive functions are the main neurocognitive functions that are extremely important to maintain a good mental health and adequate adaptation of daily life functioning. 
as you can see here executive functions are extremely important in physical health in the quality of life in school readiness and school success job success marital harmony and public safety so as we saw earlier executive functions are a set of functions that coordinate the other neurocognitive processes okay so that's why that the executive dysfunction is a extremely severe syndrome that impairs cognitive flexibility planning and emotion regulation with severe impacts in psychological health and daily life functioning so now let's see the summary and the key points so executive dysfunction it's a broad syndrome that typically is associated with executive functions as we saw also uh, executive functions are associated with the frontal lobe functioning so that's why that when we think about executive dysfunction we think about that there is some impairments in the frontal lobe and as we saw the executive dysfunction shows some psychopathology which is present in other psychopathological conditions okay so this is just an introductory video about the executive dysfunction but in the future i will show to you more about this okay so stay tuned well it's all for today don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that i recommend to you also if you like what i'm doing like share and subscribe this video also, you can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So today, let's talk about neuropsychological assessment. As you probably know, neuropsychological assessment is one major activity that clinical neuropsychologists have because it's through the process of neuropsychological assessment that we can understand which neurocognitive domain or which neurocognitive process may be damaged. But before we get further on this, first let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology, second edition. The fifth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on neuropsychological assessment. Neuropsychological assessment may be defined as the clinical science that is dedicated to the study of the behavioral expression of brain functions or end dysfunctions. Neuropsychological assessment is a performance based method to assess neurocognitive functioning. The application of performance based assessments helps clinical observations and self reports of several or various neurocognitive skills. What I'm saying about neurocognitive skills, I'm talking about memory, attention, speed of processing, reasoning, judgment, problem solving, which is including executive functions, spatial and language functions, and there are other functions that were described in previous videos. So, 
Neuropsychological assessment helps to estimate the existence of neurocognitive impairments. It assesses its intensity. It helps to define its characteristics and help to establish appropriate therapeutic approaches. Also, neuropsychological assessment helps to diagnose information for detection of brain impairments or other traumatic conditions. It helps differential diagnosis versus other psychopathologies. It helps in the measurement on the neurofunctional potential and helps clinical neuropsychologists to establish a course and development of brain impairments. It also, the neuropsychological assessment helps the measurement of the recovery of the functioning. So, it has clinical implications in the measurement of the treatment responses, which have some implications to neuropsychological rehabilitation. So, now I will describe to you how usually the neuropsychological assessment process tends to unfold, okay? First, there is an assessment request. Second, there is a study of the clinical process and clinical history. Third, there is an interview with the patient and family or companion, if is required. Fourth, there is a selection of the assessment instruments or the measures that the clinical neuropsychologists need to use to assess individuals' functioning. So, here I'm talking about cognitive screening, neuropsychological batteries or specific tests to other symptomatological conditions. Fifth, there is an application of the chosen assessment instruments and typically uh, the neuropsychological assessment process tends to end with a neuropsychological report where the clinical neuropsychologist describes the results from the neuropsychological process. Typically, this report must have some descriptions of the neuropsychological functioning, of the psychopathological conditions that were found in this process, and typically it has some guidelines to neuropsychological rehabilitation. But we will look to this in further videos. So now let's take a brief look on the summary. Neuropsychological assessment may be described as the clinical science that is dedicated to the study of behavior expression of brain functions. Neuropsychological assessment typically requires neurocognitive and behavioral assessment with several and differential tasks. It also helps in the differential diagnosis. And also it has clear implications to the neuropsychological rehabilitation program, which is typically proposed by the clinical neuropsychologist if some neuropsychological impairment was described. So this is just an introductory video to neuropsychological assessment. In the future, we will take a more in-depth look in this process, okay? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neuroscience and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neuroscience and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand a little bit more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. 
So to that, let's talk about neuropsychological rehabilitation. So here I will describe the major issues that a clinical neuropsychology must know to perform or to develop a rehabilitation program focused on the specific needs and on the specific impairments of a specific patient. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend for you today. The first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second is the fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third is the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth is the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The sixth is the neuropsychological assessment. And the sixth is the clinical neuropsychology. So now let's take a brief look on neuropsychological rehabilitation. So, Neuropsychological rehabilitation is a biopsychosocial treatment that involves the patient, their families, caregivers and the environment. It aims to improve the quality of life of patients, providing them with the greatest possible autonomy. It intervenes in the subject's cognitive deficits, also paying attention to physical, behavioral and social changes. It is also focused on the environment in which they live subjective factors in their biography in order to reintegrate the subject into their social and occupational environment. The integration of the patient in a neuropsychological rehabilitation program depends on medical evaluation and on the neuropsychological assessment, which was described in the previous video. So, based on the results of the neuropsychological assessment, a neuropsychological rehabilitation plan or program typically adapted to each patient tends to be prepared. So, in the neuropsychological assessment report, clinical neuropsychologists tend to give some proposals about a plan or a program that tends to match the neurocognitive functioning of the patient. So, it is important to differentiate cognitive rehabilitation versus neuropsychological rehabilitation. Cognitive rehabilitation aims to enable patients and families to live with, deal with, work around or reduce or overcome cognitive impairments resulting from neurological damage. So, it is focused primarily on improving cognitive functions through cognitive training. But, neuropsychological rehabilitation is a little bit different. Because, in adding to the focusing on cognitive deficits, it also aims to treat behavioral and emotional changes, improving the patient quality of life, encompassing the family and the environment. So, neuropsychological rehabilitation tends to encompass cognitive rehabilitation, because neuropsychological rehabilitation tends to be more wider in its approach, okay? Because it focuses not only in the cognitive or neurocognitive deficits, but also focuses on the behavioral and emotional changes that the patients tend to manifest based on neurological damage. So, how can we rehabilitate a patient like this? Typically, there is a replacement which implies the total loss of function and the replacement tends to reduce the deterioration in their link functioning. So, we tend to replace one function by other. So, there is another form of rehabilitate which tends to be focused on activation or stimulation. If we have a damaged area in the brain, we tend to stimulate and activate this area and improve the neurocognitive functioning. So, there is another form which is the integration, which is working with several other models. One is the ecological model, in which the person tends to engage in several tasks typically associated with the daily task, with the daily functioning of the person, that tend to stimulate the brain areas that are damaged. And the other form is the restitution, which aims to reorganize through training the conserved areas that assume part of the functioning. So these conserved areas tend to pull to themselves other functions and in this way we tend to improve the neurocognitive functioning. So all the principles that I'm saying here can be described as cognitive training, cognitive stimulation or neurocognitive rehabilitation. So different persons need to different areas of the neuropsychological rehabilitation. It all depends on the area that is damaged. So now let's see the summary and the key points. Neuropsychological rehabilitation is a neurobiopsychological treatment because it encompasses several areas of the person. It is based on a neuropsychological assessment. 
and is focused primarily on neurocognitive deficits and functionality. But as we saw previously, a neuropsychological rehabilitation tend also to encompass ecological models based on the daily functioning of the person, which also encompasses emotional and behavioral tasks. Several areas that are encompassed by the neuropsychological rehabilitation tend to be described as cognitive training, cognitive stimulation and neurocognitive rehabilitation. So, this is the first video that I'm doing about neuropsychological rehabilitation. But in the future, we have a lot to talk about this, okay? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme if you want to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Let me know what you think about all the things that you saw here. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!